Hello World History, this is part 4 of Unit 10, the last part that we're going to be talking about, which is all about nationalism in Asia. You might remember in the last unit when we were talking about imperialism, we talked about how uh, the European states, uh, a number of European states and also the Japanese were beating up on the Chinese and uh, humiliating the Chinese and how Chinese nationalism was growing and how dissatisfaction with the Qing dynasty was increasing as well. And so by about 1911, a gentleman by the name of Sun Yat-sen, who had set up a nationalist political party called the Kuomintang, was able to overthrow the last emperor and uh, establish a Chinese republic. Now his Kuomintang party, or nationalist party, was based on three principles. One of them was political rights for all, and so a kind of democracy, and then also economic rights for all, so economic fairness, and then also an end to foreign rule in China, or simply nationalism. Sun Yat-sen worked with the communists at this point in time. We'll talk about the communists here in just a second, because he felt like uh, you know nationalism was was more important, or doing away with the influence of foreigners was more important than any kind of internal economic struggle that they might be going through. But uh, after he died in the 1920s, the Kuomintang was taken over by a person by the name of Jiang Jixi, and he was much more worried about communism, and uh, he was going to be the one to fight a civil war against the communists a, a couple of uh, different times. Chinese communism gets started after World War uh, I, when really when the Soviet Union was starting to come into existence, and Mao Zedong is the, or was the leader of the Chinese Communist Party in 1921. The Chinese communists attracted a, a, quite a number of peasant farmers who were angry at the Kuomintang for more or less not taking their uh, economic problems seriously or certainly not as seriously as the communists would, because as you know, communists want everyone to be equal. And uh, as I said, Jiang Jixi wanted to eliminate communism, and so a Chinese civil war broke out by about 1930 between the communists and the Kuomintang. Now, the Kuomintang, or nationalists, were much more powerful at this point in time than the Chinese communists, and uh, they had them surrounded and, and were about to destroy them, and about 100,000 communists uh, escaped the, uh, the annihilation that, that might have happened, and went on an incredibly long journey, or a long march. I think it was about 6,000 miles long, actually. And the whole way they were, you know, um, standing up to the, the Kuomintang army when they were trying to uh, catch them, and uh, really challenging landscape, and then also um, uh, quite a bit of bad weather. And by simply persevering it, and, and by not being wiped out, the communists actually got a lot of, uh, of support from, uh, from the peasants, that the peasants really felt like they were, that their perseverance was something to, to admire. In the 1930s, Japan was uh, still at it and uh, attacking China and trying to take away some of their land. And um, both the communists and the nationalists then decided to put their fight to the side for a bit. And, uh, and, and both tried to uh, resist Japanese army. Well, after Japan was defeated in World War II, the, uh, the nationalists and the communists started to fight once again. And uh, by, the, by 1949 or so, the communists had won, and we'll talk about more modern China in a later unit. In the last unit, we also talked about India. We talked about Indian nationalism and uh, things like the Sepoy Mutiny. And the same thing is kind of occurring in India, that there is a continued struggle for Indian nationalism against Britain. The Indians wanted to be free from British rule. There were two groups of, uh, of people who wanted to... Who, who had the same goal, in other words, independence from, from Britain. One of them was the Indian National Congress, which was made up of people who were Hindu. And then there was also the Muslim League, which was made up of Muslims. And as I said, both of them are working toward independence. When World War I broke out, Britain needed Indian help to win the war, and more than a million Indians signed up to help the British, thinking that and, and uh, believing that the British would give them more rights and, and more, um, more independence after the war. But that really doesn't happen. After the war, the British really kind of want to continue with controlling India. And the Indians protested that. 
Several thousand of them went to a demonstration at a place called Amritsar, and the British were worried about this, what they considered to be an illegal nationalist demonstration, and so they ordered British troops or, or their troops to fire at these people who were peacefully demonstrating. And this is called the Amritsar Massacre. And uh, once this happens and, and, you know, the news of it gets out all over India, many more Indians started to turn against the British and become much more nationalistic. The most famous Indian and a, an Indian nationalist in, in a nice way is Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi became the leader of the independence movement by 1920, and his idea, and it's an idea which a lot of people have great respect uh, for Gandhi for, was to encourage civil disobedience um, and also nonviolent protests. And so really what civil disobedience means is not uh, participating in anything that was British. And so, you know, calling for boycotts of British goods and British schools and paying British taxes and participating in elections that really weren't going to make them free from British control. He also organized strikes and demonstrations and marches, and once again, all peacefully. And it's uh, it was really difficult for the British to do anything uh, against the Indians if the Indians were simply um, you know, not complying with what the British wanted to do. And the British got frustrated and um, in, in, by the 1930s had granted India limited self-rule. The rest of that story will happen uh, after World War II in another unit. Let's go back to the Ottoman Empire, which we talked about as well. And you might remember that the Ottoman Empire was dealing with some, uh, some, some problems being attacked by the Russians, for example, and, uh, and having places like uh, Egypt break away from them. Well, in World War I, the Ottoman Empire joined the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians against the, um, the British and the French and the Russians. And as you know, the, uh, the Germans, Austria, Austro-Hungarians, and then also the Ottomans lost World War I. And because of that, they lost most of their empire outside of what's called Anatolia, or what you probably know of as Turkey. And Turkey had a, a president who was uh, a famous person who had helped them repel an attack by, uh, by Greece shortly after World War I, and his name is Mustafa Kemal. Mustafa Kemal was a modernizer, and he brought a number of new reforms to this new Republic of Turkey. It's kind of like what happened in China, where you had an end of, um, of rule by a kind of emperor, or at least in Turkey, a sultan. And so the, some of these new reforms were things like a separation of Islam and the legal system, and creating new laws based on, on European laws, and allowing women the uh, possibility of voting and holding public office, so really a kind of feminism. And then also trying to uh, sponsor a, an industrialization that would make Turkey a, a, modern, uh, a modern country. In Iran, uh, which was uh, Persia it, the last time that we saw them, once again, they were kind of having some problems trying to... Um, keep the Russians and the British from uh, t taking them over or having too much influence in their countries. Iran became independent from Britain uh, around 1925, and it too started to modernize under a person by the name of Reza Shah Pahlavi. Saudi Arabia, also by 1932, was um, independent of any kind of British influence. And Saudi Arabia really remains traditionally Islamic and less modernized, un, un, very much unlike what was going on in Turkey or Iran at that point in time. For both Iran and also Saudi Arabia, oil was, was bringing new profits and, uh, and also Western influence. And we'll talk about what happens with Iran and Saudi Arabia in, uh, in an upcoming lesson. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this lecture and that I answered all of the questions that are on your essentials. Thanks.